So Shauna, Gary, keep letting them in as they come. I'm going to get started and talk through um, a little bit of what we're going to discuss today. And just like Shauna had asked a second ago, you know, how many people will be attending? And, you know, for my sessions that, that I do once a month, these webinars, I genuinely don't know how many people are going to attend. There's so many things that happen day to day to day or place to place that I record these sessions and make them available on my website, but also on my YouTube channel, should anybody want to watch them later. Uh, so thank you so much for participating today and joining. Uh, whether you're catching this live or you are catching the recording, I do appreciate that, that you're here. Um, please have your mobile device close by. I'm guessing that it probably already is, but I'm going to use a polling software uh, to be able to. And if anybody is not on mute, please make sure that you are on mute and I'll keep going uh, in the discussion. But I want to use some polling software to see from those folks who are attending live today. Just a couple of questions to make it fun and interesting. And I might also ask you a few questions that you could uh, put a response in the chat box and see if there's uh, anything that we can learn from one another too. I'm a big fan of peer-to-peer -peer learning whenever, whenever possible. So in the email that I sent this morning, you probably received a PDF uh, to chapter four of my book called I Know. And I just wanted you to have that chapter because there's some pieces of that that I will reference in today's discussion, but I also want you to have the chapter for some of the things that you might be doing in the next couple of weeks post uh, our discussion today. So if you uh, haven't met me yet or we haven't had a chance to, to interact, here's a quick background on, on who I am for the last 10 years. I've been a speaker and leadership consultant and my work has been guiding leaders and organizations through really big challenges and transformation. I'm, I'm a really big fan of listening actively. And I like to try to create safe places for people to really like feel heard, express themselves or be vulnerable, take risks, learn, right? really find a way to become their true self. So my mission is to unlock human potential. And when we talk about branding today, just understand that that's a key piece for me. And my number one core value is authenticity. So I believe that all persons have the answers inside of themselves, right? Some of those really pressing questions that we all can have. We don't necessarily need to look to a celebrity or to an athlete or to a politician to get the answer from them. We just have to sit in meditation or prayer or some sort of stillness or be in nature. And I think the answers will come to us with then. So big fan of authenticity. I think society historically over the last probably 100, 200 years has been really focused on projecting an image out through social media or through media. And I'm really about authenticity through the lens of how do I help people share both their highs and their lows through life? about telling really a whole human story, not just the highs of it, if you will. And so that's really, for me, what this is about. If you want to visit michaelsiever.com, lots of downloads, 200 plus blogs, lots of media features, videos that I just referenced from previous webinars that I've done. Um, so there's quite a bit there if, if you're interested at all to be able to get access to some of those complimentary resources. So what I wanna do uh, today is to be able to dive just a little bit into a couple of things when it comes to branding. And when you think about why do personal brands actually matter and look a little bit at, you know, the definition of personal branding from, from my lens or leadership branding from my lens, I'm going to give you some statistics that I've seen recently from an entrepreneur article, and then talk a little bit about what are the processes that you might be able to utilize to discover your brand in more in depth. So how you go about living your brand is up to you, but I'm going to give you a process for how to discover it. And then share with you a few examples from, from some folks in my circle that, that could be interesting or helpful for you. So Malcolm Forbes has a quote uh, that I saw recently, and it's that too many people overvalue what they are not and undervalue what they are. And that to me was a pretty striking quote when it comes to thinking about leadership, you know, and authenticity and personal branding, because our society is really based on fear and some other things like that. So how do we get people to focus a little bit less on fear and what's happening in society? and overvaluing who they are. So I'm gonna see if we can jump over to Mentimeter and I'm gonna ask you to, to grab your mobile devices and see if we can't do a polling question for the entire group. So if you go to www.menti.com, so open up a new browser on your mobile device, go to menti.com and you can see the code there at the top and the code is 515749. So again, www.menti.com and use the code 515749. So the question in one sentence, can you state your leadership brand? Um, and there's no right or wrong answer. Your answers are completely anonymous. Not even I can see who said what. So I just want to get a, a little bit of flavor or a feel for some of the folks on the call today. Do you feel comfortable stating your brand 
in one sentence. Okay, so for those folks participating, we're at this place where most of us are kind of a maybe and that's okay. So just keep an eye on that or remember that as we're going through the rest of our discussion, keep your phone close by because we're gonna ask a few more questions through Mentimeter. But uh, most of us are kind of at that point of maybe, one of us is pretty sure, a couple of us are pretty sure that it's a no and that's okay too. So I'll go back to the slides. And what I wanna start with just a really, really quick overview of why personal brands matter and why it is that it's so important from like a psychological human level. And so what has happened recently in society is we see a lot of additional uh, anger and frustration and emotion in society. And what has happened is that NASA tracks something called the precession of the equinoxes. And within the last couple of years, Earth's uh, magnetic pole has actually shifted and moved. And that shift in energy on Earth is causing a lot of additional emotion within people. So what astrologists call that shift is the move from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. And so th this transition happens on Earth every 2,165 years. And in the age of Pisces, right, so before this change, the age of Pisces was built upon this idea of centralized power. It was built around hierarchy. It was built around having limited information except for those people that were at the top. It was really about how does somebody believe in something or someone outside of themselves? But very recently, Earth has made this transition into a place where we're in the age of Aquarius. And it's very much about decentralized information, moving to holocratic networks, very having very transparent information from a lot of different sources, right? We now have the World Wide Web where we can get the world's information completely for free and online. And there we've made this transition from believing in something outside of ourselves to knowing we have the answers inside of ourselves. And that's why I called my book, I Know, is it's very much about finding a way for people to believe that they do have the answers inside themselves. To be successful today, to have a really, really strong personal brand today, is it's very much about accepting yourself as a whole person for the good and the bad, right, that may be happening in your life. So now we're no longer the railroad car that's attached to some sort of an engine. In the age of Aquarius, we are now the engine that's pulling all the cars. Right, so big distinguishment there between what it is that we used to have to do in the age of Pisces versus what it is that we are going to be today. So on the left is Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you can see that there are eight levels. And as we go through society, each of us is going to start at a different point depending on our age or depending on where on earth we were born. But it's important to recognize when it comes to uh, where we're at and understanding what our personal brand is, is that our goal in life for all humans is to ascend up this ladder, if you will. So we all have these kind of same core needs, but how we ascend them or how we go up and down them is different from person to person to person. What's really about is how do we help one another go through these various phases and things in life and continue to climb that ladder meaningfully. So when we have a personal brand, the reason why they're so important is that it can help us climb the ladder on the left faster or more meaningfully. Right. If we don't have something that's guiding us, it makes it a little bit harder to know where we're at on this ladder in this hierarchy. But it also, if we have the brand, it makes sure that we're able to climb it much more, more meaningfully. And you can see by looking at the chart on the left that the first four needs are focused on deficiency, right? Not having enough. But once we get to the point of making sure that many of these things in society are cared for, having safety, feeling like we're belonging to something, uh, being able to achieve a certain amount of things in our life, once we've gotten to those respective points in our life, now it goes to how do we grow and develop? So having a personal brand helps us continue to grow and develop in our own way, but it also helps us contribute to something much larger than ourselves. And as we can see, the very top level of Maslow's hierarchy is helping others to get to the point of self-awareness or self-realization too. Now on the right-hand side, you see Carl Jung's four life stages. Um, Carl Jung is definitely one of those guys, a Swiss psychiatrist. He's, I think he passed away back in 1961, but he was essentially a student with Sigmund Freud uh, back in the day, talking about a lot of psychological stuff. So he was the initial kind of founder or writer of the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And he's written a number of books. He's done a lot of different things in his life, but he's a very, very learned man when it comes to understanding human psychology. So what I'm really cognizant of when I'm helping a client is I'm trying to understand which one of these four stages on the right-hand side someone is in. 
And again, when we know ourselves, when we know what our personal brand is, or we know our mission, or we know what our core values are, we can matriculate through these stages possibly a little bit easier. So again, no right or wrong timing around which stage we're in or how we move between them. It's just important that we navigate that meaningfully and purposely. So having the brand helps this process become a little bit more smooth, helps us learn faster, helps us teach others. And I think probably most importantly, and for those of you who have grandparents or maybe aging parents, um, what I've done when I've talked to my grandparents right at the time, just pretty close to their death, is, is that I've asked them questions about regret. And so when we get through life, we want to make sure that we're living life fully and experientially so that we don't feel regret at some point later. And I think that's one of the things we try to do as human. We want to make sure we leave a strong legacy, but we also don't want to live a life with regret where we can't go back and make any of those changes. So just be mindful of the procession of the equinoxes and how Earth has moved into the age of Aquarius, that all human needs, we all experience them roughly the same. We could be at any of those levels on the left-hand side of the screen differently at any point in time, but our work is to continue to ascend. And on the right-hand side, we always want to move from stage one to two to three to four powerfully or meaningfully, but also to help those around us. And so having a brand or a leadership brand that's authentic to you, make sure that you're attracting the right people to you to make sure that you move through those zones powerfully and meaningfully. So on the left-hand side, uh, when we think about personal branding, I put a definition on the left from, it's a unique combination of skills and experiences that make you who you are, right? There are probably many other uh, versions of personal branding that or definitions that you could probably think of or, or add yourself. But I wanted to point out something uh, for me that was a really big uh, distinguishment after I really got to a level of awareness of myself was is that the, the logo on the, the bottom where it says Seaver Consulting, when I first started my business in 2011, that was the logo that I was known by, right? That was the logo that my business was out in the community as. So as I started to go through my process of awakening and starting to get more clear about what was really truly authentic to me, I started to think about this value of changing my logo to my, my signature. So at the top logo, Michael S. Seaver is the, what you would see on my website or how you would know me in the community now. And that was a very intentional play from me because my number one core value is authenticity. So I wanted to be able to display something that's truly authentic about each person on this planet, which is his or her signature. Right, so I wanted to find something that was really interesting. So my personal brand is very much about somebody who cares about authenticity or unlocking human potential. And one of the ways that I can embody that is by using my signature as my logo. So a brand is something that in many ways, personally, or for, for a leader, is how you are differentiated from someone else, right? It can help associate you with certain qualities it helps others to build some level of trust in who you are more meaningfully. It may help you demonstrate specific types of knowledge in a specific you know, subject or field that's meaningful. I've seen brands or the right brands open up really, really good solid doors, right? For people to advance in their career. Um, it does help to project an image, right? If you're doing something online and making sure that people are perceiving you authentically, uh, meaningfully. Um, it also can help in some meaningful way build confidence, right? It's really valuable that when we have something that's authentic to who we are, we can build confidence in a meaningful way from that. So when we think about uh, certain qualities around personal branding, there are so many things that, that can occur. What's important to recognize is that there's, there's color can be associated with branding. Um, and that's why you can see the bottom logo is both blue and orange, right? Blue is very well known in the psychology of color as being about trustworthiness, about being about competence, about being about confidence. Orange is very much about something bright in the future, right? It's optimism, it's uh, intensity, right? It's, it's doing things forward thinking. And so when we think about our brand, be mindful of how you associate color with your brand. And although I don't reference it at all in the rest of the presentation today, uh, Sally Hogshead wrote a book called How to Fascinate. And it's a great book because it has a, a survey in it that will allow for you to take and answer a couple of questions, but it'll come back and tell you what colors could be associated with your personal brand. So if that's interesting to you or you would like to associate a color with your brand, please take a look at How to Fascinate from Sally Hogshead. And that could be an interesting way to, to open a few new doors for you. So when it comes to uh, some, some statistics, when I think about branding and why it's important, I found this article on Entrepreneur. You can see the in the lower right-hand corner of the, the URL, and I can send it to you later when the presentation's done. 
But I wanted to look at why is branding important from the lens of recruiting or from growth of a business or even for personal brands. So if you are one of those folks that kind of answered maybe to say, hey, I don't, you know, kind of can say what my brand is, or some of you are like, hey, I'm not quite sure yet, and both are okay. But here's some reasons as to why it could be really valuable for you. So under the recruiting box at the top there, 70%, according to the research in this entrepreneur article, 70% of candidates uh, were rejected by a human resources office or a recruiter based on their online profile. So if you're out there and you happen to be in some sort of career transition or you're looking for a new job, there is the possibility that if you do not have a defined brand, there's the possibility that you might get rejected for a role simply because you didn't share who you are authentically through your resume, through LinkedIn, or through some other social media channel, right? 85% of the human resources persons who reported in this particular survey also said that online reputation really influenced their decision and whether or not to hire that person. So what we don't want to have happen is that doors would close on you just because there wasn't a congruous brand that was put out into the community across all of the different ways that you share yourself from resumes to LinkedIn to social to the way that you show up in person to the colors that you choose. We want to make sure that there's a congruity that exists across all of those things. Now, the second box around growth, this is important that if you happen to be like a salesperson or if you happen to be an entrepreneur and you're trying to grow and, and build something, what this article found was that 84% of decision makers start their buying process from a referral, right? So if you have a really, really strong brand and you're out there uh, sharing yourself and sharing your message, right? The people that are hearing your message are likely to remember you and make recommendations of you to the people who are asking, right? So by putting yourself out there, you're giving yourself a better chance to possibly have your product be sold or maybe open up some new doors as an entrepreneur for you. That's important. So 65% of the respondents to the survey believe that online search was a really trusted source of information. But if a person is unsure of what his or her brand is and they're not sharing it well through social channels, right? We're good. Some of those opportunities for growth may be missed because there's such a large percentage of people that are out there searching that they see it as a trusted source. We gotta make sure that we're taking advantage of that in a way that genuinely helps us. So really deep, meaningful quality relationships are really truly the start and the close of business deals, right? So we moved from this place of quantity into this place of quality. So telling our story meaningfully does help us to secure those new clients or secure that right job, whatever those things might be. So let's make sure that our relationships start off on a good foot by us being able to share who we are authentically. And the bottom one about personal brands. So when we think about how an organization's message gets meaningfully shared, what the survey found was that when a brand message is shared on a social channel, right, they get when, sorry, when a brand message is shared on a social channel by an employee, they get 561% more reach when they're shared by that employee versus being shared by that company's social page. Right? So if you really want to share your message in a very big, large way, the company's social media channels is likely to have not, not great reach, but by getting the employees of that organization to share the message, it's 560 times more likely to get out in front of the right people. And that's important, right? So when we're out there meaningfully sharing our message, it's going to get to more people. So brand messages are also reshared 24 times uh, in 24 more times places, right, when they come from an employee as opposed to when they're coming from that brand social media channels. So when we think about these things, Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z, they're moving to a place where they don't necessarily trust big corporations or big organizations or hierarchical entities. We're starting to shift to this place where we like Lyft and Uber, VRBO, Airbnb, we like Yelp, Amazon, we like Facebook and LinkedIn. We like all these places because we can get information from people like ourselves, right? We like to be able to connect with and have conversations with people that are like ourselves who have possibly gone through some sort of a situation or experience like what it is that we want to go through. So we have to be really mindful of how society is going through these changes, right? The shift from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius and the shift from very hierarchical models down to holocratic models. And as this decentralization occurs, if we don't share our message, we're likely to get overlooked by recruiters. Or if we don't share our message, some of those sales opportunities for us might not occur. Or if we don't share our message, some of the things that 
uh, we might be doing won't be shared as far or as wide as maybe that we wanted it to be. So just mindful, just be mindful of some of these statistics to help support why it is that you would invest any time into wanting to define your own brand. So on the screen is something uh, called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And so every year Edelman, which is an international public relations firm, they attempt to find who in society is deemed most credible. And when you look at the bottom, you can see that there's a, in the kind of subtext there, it says, when forming an opinion of a company, if you heard information about that company from each person on the screen, how credible would the information be, right? So how much do we trust the people that are, that are sharing some sort of a message? And so this survey that Edelman had done was done across 27 international markets and there were 33,000 respondents. So this is a worldwide survey. And so what you can see when you look at the right hand side of the chart is that at scale across the world, people don't trust government officials, journalists, boards of directors and CEOs, right? So when we attempt to share messages that are kind of crafted for these people and then they share it, there's a lot less trust and credibility and, uh, and integrity possibly that comes from that message. But the important point why I, why I use this piece of data is if you look at the left, when we receive a message from a company technical expert, an academic expert, or a person like yourself, that message is received with a lot of credibility. Okay, so big juxtaposition, right? 20, 30 years ago, we used to think that the board of directors or the CEO was genuinely a, a safe place to share good, solid information. We don't perceive it as a society that way anymore. But what we do perceive to be credible is, quote unquote, a person like yourself. But if you don't have a brand, right, and you're not sharing that brand openly with a lot of different places, how do you know who is like yourself? Okay, that's the really important piece for us is to be mindful of what is it we're sharing? How do we then unknowingly attract some of those, those same people back into our life? It's important. So what I want you to think about when you think about this slide is, is that as society continues this decentralization, we have to really be asking ourselves, what will others trust me for? Right? We have to really think about what is it or who are the members of my tribe that I want to attract or that I want to have experiences with, or what is it that I am going to proactively intentionally share about myself and my journey to allow for some of those people to come into my life. Right? So the way that it works, I think, especially as I've been doing this for a number of years, is, is that when we are really defined in who we are and what it is that we're doing, it becomes a heck of a lot simpler for us to share our messaging and then people start coming to us with questions and with comments and, and wanting ideas. So we can never really be that true leadership unique brand if we don't first put something into play and allow for other people then to be attracted to it or to ask us questions about it. So when we think about these statistics, right, there's a lot of things that are shifting in society. We're seeing this decentralization that's moving us towards wanting to spend more time getting information from a person like ourselves. So it's on us to make sure that we know ourselves really well and can then share that information with others meaningfully. So let's see if we can do another Mentimeter question. If you have your phone close by, the second question is, how would you rate your leadership brand? And there's five options there. So you could say it's a work in progress. Maybe it's below average, maybe it's average, above average, awesome. So when you think about how your employees or your friends or the people that you work with day to day to day, you know, how do they think that, that they see your leadership brand or how would you rate your leadership brand? No right or wrong answer. And again, it's anonymous. Just want to be able to see kind of where we're standing today. So I want to see how comfortable you feel expressing or sharing yourself. Okay, so a few of us are, hey, still a work in progress. That's why I'm hanging out with you today, Michael, just to see what kind of ideas you have around this. A few of you are at above average and feel pretty good about where it is. Maybe you're looking to hone your message just a little bit. And another few of you are at that place of kind of being in between, just like with the previous Mentimeter question, wanting to make sure that we are really succinct and, and sharing our message powerfully. Okay, so what I wanna share with you is uh, the process that I use when I'm helping a client directly in discovering his or her brand. And again, this morning when I sent over that email, I sent chapter four of I know because it's it's kind of the same information but with, with more expansive language and ideas. And it might be able to help you uh, as you're going through this process for yourself. So 
I'm an introvert naturally. So if you've ever done the disc assessment, I'm a high C, high S, right? So my brain really likes tasks. My brain really likes to, to have time alone, or I'd like to recharge my batteries alone. And the way that my brain is oriented is that I constantly think about logical linear processes in order to uh, be able to design a relatively holistic solution. So over the last couple of years, it was really important to me as I was coming up with this process uh, to make sure that it was really holistic and that it pulled in lots of different pieces of information. And this all first came to head for me in 2009 when I was a student at the Thunderbird School of Global Management and a career coach that I was assigned then, her name was Pam, she started to kind of help me down this path. And so I certainly wouldn't be where I'm at today being able to do the work that I do if it wasn't for Pam's guidance and kind of giving me a little bit of a, a push towards some of the things that you see on the screen and how it all comes together. So important to recognize is that what we're doing is we're taking these five different pieces of the puzzle, if you will, and the ideal outcome, which I'll go through, is to really get to the point of being able to draft a personal mission statement, being clear about core values, what's your unique value proposition, and how do we design goals that are really meaningful to you based on the information that we'll kind of bring together that becomes your data. So what I would suggest that you do, not right now, of course, but in the next couple of weeks is whether it's opening a doc on your computer or if it's grabbing a piece of paper and just kind of looking uh, for some of those patterns or themes as you're going through your information, it'll help you to make sure that there's validity to uh, this piece of the process. So I'm gonna go through each of the five sections and then uh, we'll, we'll try to figure out how to kind of wrap it all up together meaningfully for you. So the first piece of the puzzle, right, when I think about designing a personal brand is uh, definitely the disc. And so if you're looking at the handout by chance, it's on page five of the handout that I sent. And so this section is page five. If you have never done the disc, but you want to substitute the Strengths Finder or the Myers-Briggs or the Predictive Index, Four Colors or Genetics, any of those will work. So if you've done any of those communication or personality assessments, that's more than okay. Each of them is really designed to help you understand your observable behavior, right? What it is that other people around you can see you do. From the things that you say to the tone of your voice to your body language, these assessments are designed to help you understand observable behavior, right? How do you interact with the world around you? So it's important to see those tendencies or those habits or those behavioral cues that, that you do. And I put on the screen a number of things around introvert, extrovert, those things. So just as a reminder about these assessments or about the DISC specifically, is, is that introverts are naturally love to be able at the end of a really long day, they love to be able to spend time alone. They like to be able to think, read, spend time with family members. They are great closers and finishers of projects. But what's important to recognize about them is that they also view themselves as being less powerful than the environment around them. So we have to be mindful when we're designing a personal brand is to recognize how it is that we perceive the world so we can design a system or a structure or a brand that fits into that. So introverts, right, they tend to be a little bit more quiet, a little bit more reactionary, perceive themselves as less powerful than the environment versus the extroverts who are very much an action oriented person. They love to be innovative. They love to start things. So if you know that about yourself and you happen to be an extrovert, fantastic, right? We wanna make sure that we design a brand that shows that you're innovative and creative and like to start things. Now, similarly with task versus people orientation, a task oriented person is the kind of person that always has checklists around, right? They're the person that likes to be able to make a list of things and then check them off as they go through it. Whereas a people oriented person they're very much designed towards wanting to learn from conversations and relationships. So if that happens to be you, we want to design a brand that allows for you to have lots of time with other people where you can ask questions and receive information and integrate ideas. But if you're a task-oriented person, we want to design a brand that's built upon learning through books or podcasts or you know, webinars like this, whatever that might be. We want to make sure we design a brand where you're learning through those circles if possible. And people who are uh, INS on the disc, right? They're a little bit, those people are into folks, they're a bit more optimistic. Their brains are hardwired that way. Those people that are a little bit more task oriented, they tend to be a bit more pessimistic, right? When it comes to the things that are happening around them. So also be mindful of that, right? I'm being a high C on the disc or those folks who are on this call that might be a high D, they tend to be a bit more pessimistic and think about risk mitigation. So designing a brand that really helps to make sure that they have time in the day to be able to express gratitude or do something that helps their brain think a bit more optimistically is also genuinely helpful. 
So the great thing about DISC and Emerge Genetics and MBTI, there's also things that we can learn about ourselves about how we would deal with negotiation, what is our default emotion under stress. These things matter tremendously because we can bake them into our branding statements, but also how we manage our energy day to day to day. So I love looking at the DISC and giving out the assessment because it really does help to make sure that you see yourself in a really clear light. And TTI, who I use in North Scottsdale, Arizona, they've, I think they've got, got more than 30 million people who have done the assessment. So their validity score is really high. It's a very fair representation of who you are. So if you really want a third party validated assessment, TTI or somebody like that can really genuinely help. So the first step in understanding our personal brand is to first gather as much information from the disc as we possibly can. So if you've done this or something like it, what I want you to be mindful of is as you're looking at that report, what words, phrases, descriptive language that you see as you're reading through the port can really help paint you in a positive light, right? So it's going through page by page and looking at the report, looking for that language that you see recurrently, but also does really help to display your skills in a meaningful way. So if you take that sheet of paper and you write down five, eight, nine, ten ideas, that's a great first place to start is to be able to say, here's something that's a third party validated assessment of who I am. And here are some of the ideas that seem to come from all of the pieces of this assessment. Let's make sure that we use that when we're drafting our statement. So the second piece of the puzzle is something called the 12 driving forces. And I look at this, uh, again, it comes from TTI, but I look at it as the unobservable motivators, right? Why we do what it is that we do. So they're really like unobservable subconscious motivators that guide our choices, even if we don't always know that, that they're necessarily there guiding our choices. So I've, I've done a couple other webinars in the last few months, and one of them uh, was about communicating across generations. And you can see that on my website or on my YouTube channel. But what I talk about in that is a guy named Dr. Bruce Lipton and the research that he's done into the five brainwave states and understanding how the things that we learn from birth until age six, we unknowingly unconsciously repeat the rest of our lives. And so if we really have the time to kind of go back to that phase of our life and think about the things that were happening around us or the things that our parents taught us or our community taught us, we can now see how there's some connection between our behavior today and that phase in time. So with the 12 driving forces, and again, this is probably page six, I think, of your handout. Uh, maybe it's a little bit later. But when we look at the handout, I put all 12 of the driving forces in there to help you see, you know, kind of what they are, or what are those things that might be motivating to somebody. But what I love about TTI's survey is, is that their report comes back and it takes these 12 driving forces and it breaks them into three different categories, right? The top four are primary to you. The second are situational to you. And the third are indifferent to you. So when I'm coaching somebody, I try to get them to focus in on the top four, right? What are those top four motivators that unobservably, unconsciously guide their choices and behavior? And so if we know what those things are, we can consciously design a brand that helps to make sure we invite more of that into our day and into our experience and into our time. Now, the 12 driving forces, you can see there's six different things on the left-hand side of the screen. So one of the driving forces is built upon how do we acquire knowledge? Another driving force is, is, how is it that we want to use our time? Do we want something in return? Do we not? Uh, another one is around, do we like chaos in our environment or do we like a, harm, a harmonious environment? Or another one is, is that are we a little bit more selfless when we're assisting others or do we expect something in return from the other person we're helping? So once we know these things are the top four of your 12, we can now again, look through the report, try to find some of that descriptive language about who you are and come up with those maybe eight, nine or 10 keywords because we wanna see what it is that really is the driver behind why we do what we do. So oftentimes from birth until age six, we are uh, we're acculturated via our parents or our guardians at that time. And we, and we don't necessarily know what it is that we're learning or, or being taught, but then throughout the rest of life, we unknowingly unconsciously repeat that and so part of that might be taught from some of the things that you're seeing on the screen or from your report specifically, but just be mindful of the fact that we have these unconscious motivators. It's best to be able to explore them and learn them, and it's best to be able to spend more time in your day doing things associated with them, right? That's genuinely going to make you happy, make you engaged, give you joy, and make sure that the what it is that you're projecting about your brand out into the community is relatively robust and, and accurate, okay? 
So another Mentimeter question for you to consider is, you know, what is one word that others would use to describe you? So you can freeform your responses inside the app. So what is one word others would use to describe you? Okay, some good stuff coming back. Insightful, enthusiastic, trustworthy, passionate, courageous. You can answer multiple times if you want. Responsible, brave, patient, happy, principled. That's a good one. So dependable was answered a couple of times. Passionate a couple of times. Happy, calm. Love being able to think about the way that others perceive us, right? Whether it's a 360 assessment or uh, something that Harvard had pushed out in 2006 called the reflected best self. Another great way to be able to see how others uh, perceive us. So I want you to think about whatever it is that you just typed in here for this word that describes you and add it to your list of things when you're thinking about your brand is, is that over long periods of time, right? When we have multiple people saying the same things about us, the probability is, is that there's some consistency there that we want to be mindful of and use it in how we display ourselves to the world. So thank you for uh, responding to that. Keep your phone close by. I will answer a few more, uh, but I, I love that you answered there. Now, the third piece of the puzzle when it comes to branding is our core values. And you can see on the left-hand side, I've got a bit of a partnership with the Peak Fleet, and I love their not only their card deck, but they also have an online activity now that they use to help people uncover what their top five or six core values are. So the reason why I like this, this, this idea of core values so much is, is that if you've ever read Influence by Robert Cialdini, this is a, a good way to look at what he calls the law of liking, right? And there are six laws when it comes to influence, if you will, but one's called the law of liking. And so if you want to follow a little bit more or learn more about the peak fleet or core values, I think it's page 12 of the handout that I sent this morning. So take a peek at that for a bit more information. But when I think about core values, it's not necessarily something that we learn a whole lot about in society, right? It wasn't really taught for many people in K through 12 or maybe undergraduate or graduate studies. It's not something that's openly discussed, but I think it's becoming a part of culture more today than it might have been in the future. But I really believe that core values are foundational beliefs that a person lives or maybe that an organization can operate from. They can be deeply ingrained principles that can guide a person or an organization's behavior, especially when they're interacting with others, I really see them as like cultural cornerstones, right? Ways to be able to really know what a person is about. But I also think that they can't be right or wrong. And so one of the things that we have to be mindful of is that even though there are specific core values that might work inside of our family group or our friend group or the organization we work for, uh, the likelihood is, is that from place to place, they may not always be the same it's probably contextual. And over the last couple of months, I've had to lead three mediations between employees. Um, and we use these core values kind of as the core of the discussion because they were having so much trouble being able to communicate with one another that not even a disc or other type of communication assessment was helpful. We had to go one level deeper on the onion and use the, the core values as a way to be able to help people understand why they behave the way that they did. So core values can help in a lot of different ways. They can't be right or wrong from person to person, but application can be contextual because what works here may not work in China or in Germany or somewhere in South America because the values, the norms, and the mores of that place are a bit different. So just be mindful that if you, maybe there's other assessments that you've, that you've done online. Um, I just like what the, the Peak Fleet has done through the card deck or through the online activity because it really does help us to take what would be 55 core values that may or may not apply to us and really whittle the list down to six to make sure that we really know what's engaging or interesting to us. And I did a, a webinar about this topic, I think last month. And what I talked through was a couple different strategies or ways that you could live your core values more day to day and thereby exude your brand a bit better or ways to use core values to connect an employee more deeply to the organization by tying their core values to the organization's core values. Right? So there's a way to be able to kind of make that emotional connection, if you will, by, by using those values. So not only do we get to the point of understanding ourselves, but we might also be able to draw people more connected to the environment that they're in. 
So the benefit of knowing our core values, right? We could possibly be more accountable. There's possibility of having higher emotional intelligence, possibility that if we know our values and distribute our time appropriately, we limit interruptions, right? That happen around us. Now we can also uncover our why or our mission a little bit easier. I also think that in knowing our values, we have this ability to feel in flow, right? We can kind of let the world around us shut off, if you will. So we are more happy when we're doing things that we genuinely are interested in, right? And we lose track of time doing the world kind of shuts off around us. So I want people to be mindful of knowing what their core values are, spending more time doing it, not only because it helps us with a brand, but it also helps us distribute time into things that, that genuinely matter. So another piece of the puzzle, core values. Now, the hardest part, I think, of this process um, is the, the questions, I think, uh, probably page 14 of the handout that I sent this morning. And it takes a little bit of time to be able to go through and, and ask and answer all these questions. But it is pretty important, right? Because when we think about the five pieces of the puzzle, the first three steps of the puzzle are done by a third-party verified assessment distributor, right? This particular piece of the puzzle is just you talking about you. Right, so we've got this kind of third party data piece, but now I want to integrate a little bit more about your journey in your story and why it's important. So part of the thing that I said earlier when I first kicked off today's webinar was that it's life to me is about sharing both the highs and the lows. And that's how I've designed the questions that are on page 14 of the handout is for us to be really mindful of both the highs and the lows to make sure that when we share our brand, we're not just sharing the optimistic, happy pieces of our journey, we're being really authentic and human and sharing both the highs and the lows. And so for those of you who have read the first chapter of my book, you know that there was a period in May of 2019 that was pretty challenging for me. And so we all go through those things. It's what Joseph Campbell calls the hero's journey. It's just, do we all have the, the people around us or do we have the right environment to be able to share those things? So one of the things that I'm trying to do in asking people the questions that are on page 14 of the handout is to really find patterns in someone's life. So the 10 questions that are designed to ask you about your past are really designed purposely. And you can see in the lower left-hand corner of the screen that they're really designed to help basically find three things. So the first is, is what is the recurring challenge that you went through in your younger years? Right, so from birth until about age 28, what were those things, those trying experiences, those perceived problems, what were those, those recurring challenges that just popped up? Because inside the challenge is the key to where your mission statement will lie in the years that come. Likely around age 28, 29, 30, you overcame the challenge, right? There was something that happened. I shared the story of Pam earlier. Pam was one of those key people in my life that helped me overcome the challenge powerfully. So if it wasn't for her, I think I probably would have struggled quite a bit more. So important to recognize what it was that we did to overcome the challenge. And that's an important piece. But the third piece is that where we're going to find the most meaning, where our personal mission is going to be the best or the most meaningful for us, is that if we can help other people overcome the same challenge we had in our younger years. Right. So from birth until age 28, we had a recurring set of challenges. Around age 28, 29, 30, we overcame them. Now the next 20 years of your life is really well spent if you're helping other people overcome the same challenge for themselves. And that can happen in any number of ways from the job that we do to the business that we run to the not-for-profit we engage to the things that we do inside of a religious organization. It doesn't matter. It's just making sure that we're helping others overcome those too. There's also a set of questions that really is focused in on the present, who you are today, what you're doing in your current role. And it's really just a baseline or a benchmark that we're going to use to juxtapose against the future. So when I'm working with a client, I ask them to choose a date three, four, five years into the future and envision, close their eyes and envision what their ideal role would look like then. So what we end up doing is being able to show from where they're at in present to where they're going to be two, three or four or five years down the road, that gap rate there between today and that future state is where we can design goals that really help us move our brand forward, right? So just being mindful of what's the benchmark for today, where is it that we're going to go and how do those things come together to help with goals, okay? So the fourth piece of the puzzle is these questions that are in the handout that I encourage you to, to answer for yourself and we'll I ideally find patterns and themes and stuff that you can find across all of the answers, but make sure you make a little bit of time to be able to answer those questions. And if you have questions, you can email me or, and I'll try to help provide some clarity. 
So I'm going to keep going. I want you to, to answer this Mentimeter question. So snag your phone one more time. And I want you to think about your life, whether it's personal, professional, or the relationships that you have. What in your life are you most proud of? Okay, good stuff. My son, my marriage, my daughters, authentic friendships. Is it okay if I say my cat? Is that okay? That's okay with you guys? Okay, cats are good. Uh, she's sitting on the bed right next to me. So she's, I'm not the most proud of my cat, but she's awesome. She saved my life, so I'm thankful. Um, so being a good person, living authentically, the relationships that we have with others, uh, overcoming generational family struggles, uh, it's good, uh, struggles, that's a good one. Connecting with others. Someone's really proud of their home or my husband and my dog, uh, being a resource to others is a good one. So what each of us is proud of uh, is great. It's, it's unique to us and it's important for us to continue down that path and to be that for as many people as we can. So I'll go back to the slides. Thank you for, for answering that. We'll have one more question here um, in a second. But the reason why I ask you about what it is that you're proud of, you know, each of you responded with something that was a little bit more relationship focused and the fifth piece of the puzzle when we're designing our brand is very much about our authority, right? The things that we are great at. So whatever it is that we are essentially looking at in terms of strengths, in terms of accomplishments and awards and recognitions could be a degree or a certification. Maybe it's a board position or organizations that you volunteered with. So when we think about our authority, it's a little bit hard because humans are designed to be humble and to, to operate with a bit of humility. But when we think about Robert Cialdino and his book, Influence, one of the key pieces of influence is this whole idea of the law of authority. And in his book, he talks about how when we go to an expert, right, a person who displays their authority openly, we tend to view them as being able to give us a shortcut to an answer that would otherwise take us a long time to get the answer. So we want to make sure that we project our own brand in a way that shows our authority and the things that we're great at because we really then can subconsciously be viewed as an expert in the minds of others in our community. So when we think about the things that we're grateful for and proud of, right, family, relationships, awesome. We can leverage those to design a great brand, but also make sure that if you're completing this step of the process, that you're very clear about some of the accomplishments, awards, and recognitions that you have because they really do build a psychological safety in the mind of the person following you to want to hear your message and engage you in a meaningful way. That's important. So one of the pieces that is uh, a bit more challenging because it requires some thought and it requires maybe you talking to somebody else is, is that I've given you just brief descriptions of the five pieces right, of the puzzle when we're designing a brand. Now, what we want to be mindful of is that how do we take all of this information that we've gathered and how do we go through it all and find patterns and themes? And so on the handout, I think I described the section in a little bit more depth. So please reference that if you wish. But what we're doing is we're looking at all of these different things, right? These five different things are on a sheet of paper or they're, they're on the desk in front of us. And what we're doing is we're trying to crash together and find commonality across them all. And so if you, if you think about some of those things, can you look at your disk report and see something consistent across your core values? Or can you look at your past, present, and future questions and see a common theme connected back to your core values? Or can you look at some accomplishment that you had in your authority section, and can you tie that back to one of your core values? And so it's taking the time to crash together these disparate ideas in a meaningful way to find six, seven, or eight themes that you see across two or three of all of the tools. Right, so it's a little bit of a puzzle. It takes a little bit of time to put some things together. Again, email me if you have questions. I'm happy to, to share some ideas or just talk with you for 30 minutes about what that looks like. But I wanna make sure that you find the patterns, right? Because the patterns are the thing that is the thing that will give you the most courage and strength to then be able to share your brand openly uh, in the future. So a little bit of time to complete it, but also a really important piece of the puzzle because when we're pulling the same information from five or six or more places from our past, it really is authentic to who we are. And then we can be more authentic in the ways that, that we show up. So when we think about the five pieces of the puzzle, and then we try to find those six, seven, or eight themes or patterns that exist across them all, the ideal outcome of doing that work is the four things that you see on the screen. 
In the upper left-hand corner, right, we want to be able to have a mission statement. And inside the handout, there are some examples that you can follow. But whether it's one word or one sentence, we want to have that statement that we can always lean back on to really help us make those challenging or difficult choices. If you do the core values activity, it really does help you to know what your top five or six are and then to know how to spend more time doing the various things that are deeply important to you, right? So if you can always ask yourself when you're confronted with an interruption or a distraction or a choice, do I really need to do this? How is this going to contribute to something for my future? Automatically connect it to one of your six core values. And if it's not connected to one of them, then don't do it, right? It becomes pretty simple. Now the value proposition in the bottom left, pretty simple and straightforward. I help quite a few clients do this where we look at all of the resources from those five puzzle pieces, and then we look at the patterns and themes, and then we use that to write what most people would, would perceive to be like an executive biography or an executive statement. So it can be one paragraph, it can be an entire page, but part of my work as a coach is to help the client see themselves in a new light. And oftentimes that value proposition statement, whether it's short and concise or a little bit longer, we can use that in a lot of different ways. Right? Maybe it's the top of the resume, maybe it's a LinkedIn summary, maybe it's the executive biography, maybe it's somewhere on your personal website. How you use it is less important than the fact that you're using it right? and making sure that when you're confronted with choices and decisions, you're making them in alignment with your mission statement, your values, or your value proposition. Now, the last piece when we think about the present questions and the future questions is, how do we make sure that we're designing goals that really keep us focused on our mission? So the way that I help a client write a goal is to put it into the from X to Y by when format. So X is a metric driven state or an objective state for where we're at right now. And Y is that future state three or four years down the road. And when is the date by which we're going to accomplish it. And I always ask that they design at least two goals that are personal, two that are professional and two that are relationship based, right? And so we're designing these goals intentionally to make sure that they're able to live their brand in the community powerfully, okay? So we're taking these five puzzle pieces, we're finding the patterns and themes in each of them, and then we're investing the time to craft a mission statement, a value proposition statement, and five, six, seven goals, whatever it is that you're shooting for. So it's up to you how you go through and do this. It's just important to see that these are the possible outcomes. So I think that we're kind of in this place of the more that we know these things and then proactively begin to share them, the more powerful that we can be in the community. And I'll give you a couple of examples, right? There's any number of ways that, that someone can share their brand, but I have a client named Abby. She's a vice president of sales for a healthcare company in Miami. And one of the things that she absolutely loves is to take photographs when she's traveling the world. And so somehow or another, through her and my discussion, we realized that by sharing her photography on Instagram, many of her clients were following her on Instagram and those photographs and the stories that she told with the photographs allowed for her clients to trust her more and it became the core of her sales dialogue. And then all of a sudden they felt safer with her and she was able to lead the company in sales for the last couple of years, right? So it, it's an interesting way to look at it, but a really powerful way because it worked for her. Or my friend Joey, who was really in the business of making a lasting impression, had a lot of success in his younger years. He sold his first business for $45 million. So what he was trying to do was really leave a lasting impression through classes that he taught, through things that he did. But he designed this metal business card that it's impossible to just throw it into a pile of business cards, right? It's always going to be the thing that stands out. So his personal brand was parlayed through a metal business card. I have a friend, Dan. And so he, part of his brand as we went through this process was really understanding adventure and experiences. So what he wanted to do to be more authentic and to share his life is he started a YouTube channel that shared his and his partner's camping experiences and the number of views and the people that were coming into his life because he was sharing his mission with the world helped him take his employees at work on adventures, right? Work adventures, but it also helped new people in the community become engaged with them, right? Which is great. Now, Scott, another friend of mine, really big fan of economic empowerment because of some of the things that happened in his childhood. So after he built up his brand and got it into a great place, he was asked to join the board of, of Goodwill here in Metro Phoenix. So when we think about these things, the way that we apply our brand can happen in any number of ways, right? And you can see even the examples in the lower left-hand corner from Elon Musk, he's known to have an insatiable drive or Tony Robbins as being really charismatic or Gary Vaynerchuk is known as being the guy about hustle 
in the various ways that they live their brands. What's important is, is that we have a mission, whether it's one word or that statement, and then we come up with a really unique way for us to then live that brand in our own way. There's no one right or wrong way to do it. It's just that we're doing it authentically so that people around us then can pick up on that and genuinely feel inspired in their own way. And I saw a quote earlier today, I think it was on James Clear's email. And if you haven't followed James Clear, it's jamesclear.com, great guy to keep an eye on for some of his uh, work around habits and information. And the quote was, you attract luck simply by sharing your work publicly. And it's a very simple statement, but a powerful one in that if you want to have more opportunities come your way, it's just about being consistent and sharing your message with people around you. And I'll just give a quick plug before we go. It's almost the top of the hour. And you can see a picture of my book on the left called I Know. It's a practical guide for awakening to what's within and, and finding work-life integration. If you haven't read it yet, I encourage you to check it out because it's really about me telling a really raw, a really authentic story about wanting to commit suicide. And it wasn't something that I would have ever imagined would have become a part of my life. But as fate would have it, various things kind of played themselves out in the latter part of 2018 and the early part of 2019 that that seemed like a viable option for me. Now, looking back, of course, decided to stay. Uh, Cleopatra, my cat, played a big part in that. But the book is really about, it's a how-to guide, right? It's really designed to help a person in any level of an organization go through three intentional phases of change and nine distinct processes. And I just had someone who read the book uh, down in Auckland, New Zealand, email me yesterday and said that it helped him release something from his subconscious that he had been holding on to for quite some time. So clearly I wasn't expecting to receive that email, but I'm very grateful that I did. So I know that the nine processes and the material and the client examples and the research in the book might be of interest or useful. So it's an ebook, it's audio book, it's in print, um, available in a lot of different ways. And of course I gave you one of the chapters early just to, to give you a little bit of help. So in the hour that we've had today, just one final question in Mentimeter. So just interested from your standpoint, you know, what was something that we talked about in the last hour that was really interesting to you? And again, freeform your response, just type in anything. One hour always seems to go by so fast. Always does. Thank you guys for your patience. So good stuff coming back. What was the learning most interesting to you? Uh, the past, present, and future exercise, you know, being able to gather the right keywords and, and patterns and themes that exist across all of the data about you, if you will. Um, finding that pattern really does help you to see yourself better. Um, it really is about how can you take the, you know, this information to design some sort of a plan to not only live your brand more, uh, but also then help others live it. Um, the DISC assessment or similar can really be a solid tool, right, to understand yourself in a new light. So can the 12 driving forces or the core values activity, um, those things matter. Or like the telling stats, the, some of the things that I shared there were pretty darn important too. Um, so thank you all for, for participating and thank you for uh, responding there. So when I think about personal branding, uh, there's any number of ways that, that we can look at this. There's no right or wrong way to do it. There's any number of ways to, to live it. But what I want to really drive the point home, and then I'll let you go, is that in the age of Aquarius, right, we've entered into this age, is that humans are starting to realize that they're far more similar than they are dissimilar, right? We're equal but different. And it's in that difference that we're starting to feel comfortable and sharing a little bit more about who we are. So just like I opened with the Malcolm Forbes quote, right? We don't want to undervalue uh, what you, we want you to undervalue what you aren't. We want you to overvalue what you are, right? It's important to, to really feel that. Number two is that we really can't any longer trust hierarchical power. We have to really move to this place of being able to trust feedback from people like ourselves and being really active and sharing our journey with others to be able to receive that feedback from others. I really believe that personal brands are best when they come from the consistencies that we find across data sources. There's a lot of value in that. And I just want to be just drive this point home is that how you share your brand is really less important than the authentic way in which you share it, right? It is important to, to really think about that. And author Brene Brown said, 
Authenticity is a collection of choices we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen, right? It genuinely does matter, right? That authenticity and how it impacts us in many, many ways. So if, if you guys don't have any questions, uh, that would bring our time together uh, to a, a quick close. I do have that special offer I do want to offer you, but before I offer that, does anybody have questions, comments, things that I can provide some closure on?